Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another evening of Civically Speaking and for tonight's conversation, Declaring Independence, the Promises and Predicaments of 1776. I'm Ryan McKittrick. I'm the ART's Director of Artistic Programs and Dramaturg. I am a white man with brown hair, and I'm wearing a light blue shirt and sitting here in an office at the American Repertory Theater, where a performance of 1776 is just about to begin in the theater right behind me. I'm really excited for this evening's conversation with an extraordinary group of scholars. Uh, but before we begin, I have a few Zoom housekeeping notes for everybody. First, please note that the Zoom chat is disabled and will continue to be disabled throughout the conversation. Second, I wanted to share that captions auto-generated by Zoom are available for those who want or need them. You can turn them on by pressing a button labeled live transcript or more at the bottom right of your Zoom screen and selecting show transcript or show subtitles, all depending on how recently you've updated your Zoom. Third, we'll reserve the last 15 minutes of the hour for Q&A with our speakers. You don't have to wait till those last 15 minutes to submit your questions. You can do that at any time during the conversation using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. A few more notes. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge that the Loeb Drama Center, where I am zooming in from this evening, is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. Next, I'd like to lift up ART's commitment to anti-racism. ART is unequivocally opposed to hate and centers anti-racism as a core value. We expect everyone in our offices hold these values, and as such, we will not tolerate anti-Blackness or racism of any kind in our buildings, nor at our offsite events. We aim to create an environment that is uninhabitable to racism and discrimination, where all BIPOC staff, artists, volunteers, audiences, and community are seen, heard, valued, and provided the opportunity to thrive. This work is only possible when we do it together, so thank you for being our partner in it. I'm so pleased to introduce tonight's conversation, which we're hosting in connection with the ART's revival production of the musical 1776, which is in preview performances here at the Loeb Drama Center. Looking ahead, we have another discussion planned for June 29th with Harvard professors Annette Gordon-Reed and Jane Kamensky, who will be talking with Timothy Patrick McCarthy about the myths and meetings of America's founding. We'll drop a link to that event uh, webpage in our chat in just a minute. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our host and moderator for this evening's conversation, Timothy Pat Patrick McCarthy, who is an award-winning scholar, teacher, and activist. At the Harvard Graduate School of Education, he is core faculty in both the foundations curriculum and the education leadership, organizations, and entrepreneurship program. At the Harvard Kennedy School, where he was the first openly gay faculty member and still teaches the school's only course on LGBTQ matters, he is faculty affiliate at the Center for Public Leadership and Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. And I'm also so happy to say that he's also on the ART's Board of Advisors. So now I'd like to welcome Tim. You can turn on your camera, join the conversation. Hi, Tim. It's great to Hi, see Ryan. you. Hi, Ryan. How are you? How are I'm you? great. It's great to see you. So I will let you take it from here to introduce Danielle and Vincent. Okay, thanks Ryan and thanks to you and to Sarah and to everyone at the ART for putting together these wonderful public programs and in particular these conversations that are so deeply and intimately linked to the work that the theater does in particular tonight. Uh, the revival of 1776, the musical. Uh, and so we're gonna talk about the musical and we're gonna talk about the Declaration of Independence and the 1776 is a predicament and so much more. So uh, without further ado, let me please introduce and, and ask my colleagues, uh, Danielle Allen and Vince Brown to, to, to take your videos off and to unmute yourselves. Uh, and let me just say a couple of words about my uh, dear friends and distinguished colleagues here. I'm not gonna read their whole bios. We would be here until eight o'clock tomorrow if I were to do that. So I'm not going to, just trust me. They're brilliant, beautiful people. Uh, Daniel Allen is the uh, James Bryan, Bryan Conant University professor and the director of the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics among so many other uh, things. Uh, most relevant to our conversation today is one of her many books that I absolutely love. Uh, called Our Declaration, a reading of the Declaration of Independence in Defense of Equality. So we're gonna get 
into that. Uh, and then uh, my other dear friend and distinguished colleague is Vincent Brown, who's the Charles Warren Professor of American History and Professor of African and African American Studies here at Harvard, also the acting director of the Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History. And Vince, I don't have show and tell for you because Tacky's Revolt is in, in Provincetown and I'm in Cambridge right now. Yeah, all right, there it is, right behind you. Excellent. Uh, most recently, Vincent Brown is the author of the multiple award-winning Tacky's Revolt, the story of an Atlantic slave war. Uh, and so we'll be getting into some of that too tonight. So uh, welcome, Danielle. Welcome, Vince. It's great to be with you. Thank you, Tim. Good to be with you as well. All right. Yeah, thank you so much, Tim. And thank you, Ryan, as well, for, for, for hosting us. Yes, excellent. So I want to begin with right now, the here and now. We're going to talk a lot about history today, but both of you have seen a preview of 1776, the musical, and I saw the last dress rehearsal about a week and a half ago. So I'd love to hear right up top your reactions to the, to the musical, what surprised you, what struck you, and why don't we start with you, Danielle? Sure, no, thank you so much, Tim. And I should start by saying I'm an African-American woman with short hair, um, natural, and um, a, a red dress, basically. Um, so anyway, nice to be with everybody this evening. Um, it was a lot of fun. So first, let me just say that, you know, it was really a good time. And so I can encourage everybody to go see the show. You'll enjoy yourself. It's an incredible cast. And I'm sure Vince will comment on this too, but sort of this beautiful cast of female non-binary trans people. And there's a huge relief, honestly, that I experienced um, from that, because you can really sort of listen to the arguments and the ideas and the positions, and you sort of end up being able to put a, aside for a moment, I mean, for a moment only, but for a moment, the sort of question of what did it mean that the sort of closed group of white male property holders did this. And it does give you a sort of chance to explore the sort of concept of revolution in a really fresh way. Um, so I think it's just really a wonderful, you know, brilliant kind of bold approach um, to this material. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Vince, how about you? What did you think? Well, thanks. I will say that uh, I'm Vincent Brown and I am a brown man, caramel with spring green undertones. And I'm wearing <laughs> a white shirt with a blue and gray uh, cross hatch pattern. And I have long uh, graying hair, rather graying at this point. Um, I loved it. I thought it was great. Um, for all the reasons that Danielle mentioned, I thought the casting was really fresh, was really brilliant to cast all these women and trans women and non-binary folks as the founding <clears throat> fathers, right? Just brought a fresh perspective on the ideas. It allowed us to kind of not associate the, as these ideas just with the dead white men, but to see how these ideas might be applicable to our present when our thoughts on gender are far more fluid than they would have been in the 18th century, or at least we assume, right? Um, that was to me kind of, kind of profound. And then I don't wanna give any spoilers here, but then there was the kind of split between the first act and the second act. We're in the first act of the show, you get a kind of civics lesson approach um, to the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the debates before the signing. And then in the second act, again, not to spoil it for anybody, things get altogether more profound, where the show really begins to ask those questions about why it matters, right? It's no longer just hero worship or hagiography. It's now, how do these ideas matter to us in our present? Why should we care? And then we really begin to see the predicament of the signers of the Declaration of Independence mm -hmm. uh, and how that predicament in some ways translates uh, into predicaments that we might feel very deeply in the present. Mm -hmm. Thank you both for that. Thank you both for those uh, reflections, which uh, align very much with, with my own. Uh, I should say, I forgot to do this. Thank you, Danielle and Vince, for reminding me. I'm a, a, a white man, uh, middle-aged, uh, short brown hair, little graying, not as much as Vince, but graying. And uh, I have a blue blazer on and a, a green, white, and blue shirt. And I'm robustly built. I like to tell people that as well. Um, I wanted to, to um, pick up, both of you mentioned the cast. Both of you mentioned the cast which is uh, among the many things that about this play that really helped to reimagine, right? Both this work of art and the history of the story that it's trying to tell. And I'm wondering if you could um, 
reflect for a second about about what you think this cast and this reimagining and revival of 1776 means in this moment when we are having so many battles about race about about gender about representation and it mattering uh, about democracy itself like how does this cast and this kind of reimagined revival speak to this moment maybe vinsko and then danielle yeah, well, let me just kind of give an example. I think one of the things that this refreshing casting does is it denaturalizes mm -hmm. the association between those ideas and those people in the past, right? And as I said, makes them available for our reflection in a kind of new way, right? So if we think of, um, let's just take Petrina Murray's fantastic portrayal of Benjamin Franklin, right? Yeah. Which has all the wisdom that we associate with Benjamin Franklin all the cleverness that we associate with Benjamin Franklin, all the innovative, innovativeness that we associate with Benjamin Franklin. And yet here is a black non-binary actor playing Benjamin Franklin. And so we get to see all of those qualities, right? Not automatically associated in the person of Benjamin Franklin in the white male, presumably heterosexual Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin. And that again, it allows us access to these ideas and a fresh perspective on these ideas that the kind of natural associations don't. And it's kind of like when, um, you know, you live your life learning what not to see because some things are so well known that you don't have to think about them. You don't have to reflect on them, right? But when something is denaturalized for you, like when you travel and suddenly you're hyper aware of all the rules and conventions that you're not aware of in your own home, that's what it does, right? It makes you aware of things in a new way and to be aware of these ideas, these and these founding ideals and these struggles, I think is a real gift to the audience. Yeah, thank you for that. I love Petrina's performance. It's fantastic. Uh, long awaited performances. Vince and I, uh, Danielle, you too, I think have been connected to this, this cast and the show for a long time. Vince and I have been working with them for two, oh, two years now, I think on Zoom yeah, mostly. Yeah, yeah. So we, we've known Petrina for years, so we've, we've been waiting for this for a long time. Danielle, how about you? What does the cast in this reimagining mean for this moment? You know, I love the way in which the um, casting, you know, casts loose, you know, it, does, it casts loose, it denaturalizes, as Vince says, from so many givens that we have mm -hmm. now kind of gotten baked into our yes. discourse, into our habits and so forth. So the notion that like it's up for grabs, like the question of well, whose past is this really? You know, does it belong to anybody in particular? You know, no, like forget that idea. It doesn't necessarily belong to anybody in particular. Instead, it's a kind of, you know, body of materials that can be creatively inspiring and that people can take in a lot of different directions. So I think really sort of severing the tie between a particular historical moment and any particular kind of present day political orientation just could not be more valuable. We've gotten ourselves sort of in the straight jacket, right? Where we sort of think like some people own a claim to, you know, 1776 and other people don't, you know, or whatever. And it's just like, feels like that's the kind of wrong way to go about, you know, mining the past um, for our own purposes in the present. And so I just love that kind of casting loose from all of that and sort of like, less, we're gonna have a good time and we're gonna think really hard and we're gonna be clear about the commitments we bring to think about freedom and equality and revolution in the contemporary context. Yeah, it's so interesting. I, I was working on a piece on politics and history recently and I went back and reread my PhD advisor, Eric Foner's book, Who Owns History? And he ends that book by saying, who owns history? Everyone and no one. Right. And, it, it, I, exactly. and I love, yeah, yeah, I love the idea of, of this. Great, great. And then so can, I, can I just on one footnote on that? Because it's, it's, that, it's that everyone and no one idea, right? Like it really matters yeah. that both of those things. Because when you say like everyone owns it, that can be, that's like really kind of saccharine at the end of the day, right? That as if we're all equally positioned in relationship to the past mm -hmm. and we're not all equally positioned in relationship to the past. So there's a sort of funny, it matters that we can all claim it but we can all also establish our own kinds of claims to it. And none of us has any actually kind of like automatic right to anything in particular in relationship to it. Oh, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I, I, tend to, I tend to think, look, you know, we're all in history. There's no outside of it. Like as long as you're alive, you're in it. When you're dead, you're still in it. <laughs> so the question is, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. yeah, and when you're dead, you have a lot less control over what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> People like us write about that. Yeah, anyway. 
uh, but we'll get ours too. Uh, let's go back to history and time. And I want to ask Vince, uh, you a question about 1776, and then Danielle, I'll follow up with a question to you specifically about the Declaration. But Vince, in a previous conversation that we had with the cast and creative team of the musical, um, you said something that has really stuck with me that I've borrowed and quoted you on for uh, quite a number of times since then. You talked about 1776 as a predicament. And you use the word predicament in your first uh, reflection about the show. So I'm wondering if you could dig a little bit into that word, what you mean by it, and how it helps us understand and reckon with the past. Yeah, well, thanks. First, I mean, let me go back to something Danielle said about, about how we get stuck mm. in our kind of rote ways of thinking about history. So we think that there's a set of names, dates, places, you know, um, significant personages, events that we all have to remember just you know kind of in a particular order in a particular story and it's fixed right and it seems like it's just something out there and then we forget right that the way things were going to turn out was not known to those people that we think are important and the only reason they're important is because they lived in situations where things could have gone a number of ways and they had to make choices or they had to take actions or they were compelled to do certain things, right? They were in predicaments. And it's the predicaments that heighten our sense of the drama of why history matters in the first place. It's the predicaments that we still experience ourselves when we think about how we're going to live our lives. And so and if we think about history as a predicament, ours and theirs, that gives us a better opportunity, I think, to learn from the kinds of choices, the kinds of examples set by our ancestors, right? in an ongoing process of transformation that endures, that is continuing, right? So a lot of the kind of processes that created racial inequality, the slave trade, the enslavement of black people, right? That predicament is ongoing. That process of racialization and the production of inequality is ongoing, right? The kind of wars that established the American, and when I say American, I mean like all of the Americas, right? The European presence in the America, the colonial conquest and the wars between European states that protected and defended those colonial conquests and the wars that facilitated the slave trade and the violence of enslavement itself, right? That violence in American states is not over. That process endures, right? I mean, we are all again, again, mourning a mass shooting, this time at an elementary school in Texas where 14 children were killed today. Right. And as a society, we seem helpless to do anything about it. That process of violence, unfolding violence, that predicament that we're in is a very old predicament in the Americas. Yeah, right? yeah. That's and it's something that is not unique to American societies but is far more prevalent here as a result of those historical legacies of colonial conquest and violent and enslavement and warfare that established the Americas, yeah. right? That's something we're still contending with. That's something we can still learn from when we think about the past. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Vince, I appreciate that. I also appreciate you mentioning literally the breaking news right now, yet another, another mass shooting uh, in the United States. Um, it's almost a daily occurrence, it feels like. Um, Danielle, I wanted to, to ask you specifically about the Declaration of Independence. You've written, uh, there are many people have written about the Declaration of Independence, right? You are one of them. And I find your book, this book, our Declaration in particular, to be just a, a, a breathtaking book and one that um, I return to over and over and over again, particularly in the way that you sort of reread against some misreadings of the Declaration, right, a certain kind of project. And, and you, you talk about a co making a coherent argument about equality. But you also talk a lot about, in, about community and, and, and individual rights and these kinds of things. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the Declaration itself, what your reading of it is and how you think uh, perhaps it's misread or misunderstood. Sure, no, I appreciate that, um, Tim. I, I'm just going to pause for a quick second, though, too, and thank Vince for acknowledging um, the shooting in Texas because um, I was, you know, myself thinking about that before we came on and wondering precisely how to acknowledge it. And I think your point that, you know, the fact that we feel helpless in the face of our culture of violence um, is the point to underscore. 
yeah. and to understand the depths of our culture and history of violence. It's, you know, it is what it means to be part of a settler colonial um, nation and a revolutionary nation. And so we need a kind of clarity about that, clear eyedness about it that um, we continue to lack. I think, honestly, sometimes I'm just gonna say one more thing and then I'll answer your question, Tim. And I apologize for the digression, but, um, and I think uh, there are a lot of folks who've been doing a lot of work on violence prevention and violence interruption, um, demilitarization, you know, uh, de-escalation and things like that. And I believe they have huge bodies of knowledge and wisdom that we haven't empowered. Um, so I just want to, to name that and sort of give us something to think about, you know, how do we pull those resources into the work um, of, of every governmental level jurisdiction. Um, so um, anyway, thank you for a little space there on that. Um, so, I mean, this, this is relevant to the declaration in a sense because um, so, and I was fortunate to teach the declaration over many years in the course of, in the context of an, a night school class in Chicago for low-income adults. The purpose of the course is to try to give people a pathway back into education when they had fallen out for whatever reason and were like juggling two jobs or, you know, trying to get kids to school and also handle a, you know, minimum wage job and so forth and trying to figure out how to get that opportunity again. So it's a set of humanities courses called Clemente courses. And I started teaching the declaration just for the very instrumental reason that it's incredibly short. So, you know, although the musical gives us, you know, two and a half hours or so of sort of the work of getting to the production of this text, it's 1,337 words and you can kind of read it, you know, in, in real brief period. And so um, we read this together, my night students and I, low income adults from all kinds of um, backgrounds, <laughs> and, um, situational. And I was just profoundly moved by the immediacy of their response. Then they got this text much faster than my day students at, you know, fancy University of Chicago, um, well-credentialed, well-heeled students and the like. And it was for the just plain reason that, you know, the declaration names dissatisfying circumstances, you know, and then gets real clear about what to do about them. And every single person in that night class was there because they were ready to change their lives. And in their profound connection to the text, what they also did was just really, from my point of view, just powerfully dramatize the whole concept of human equality, that here we are on this planet, each and every one of us trying to make tomorrow better than yesterday. And each and every one of us brings these human capacities of judgment and feeling to bear on that work. And like therein lies our equality. Like that is like the beginning and the end of the story of human equality. And then can we respect that? Can we respect that about each other? That is sort of the work of the political project of democracy is to build a context for respecting that human effort and capacity to like try to make tomorrow better than yesterday. And so just to bring this full circle, you know, I come back to like the events of Texas. I'm like, that's like the declaration is about saying like, this is not okay. And we can link arms and say, this is not okay. And having that kind of clear eyed sense of it's time for us to make tomorrow better than yesterday, then the job is to lay that path to that forward movement. Danielle, I wanted to just ask you a follow up question, because as you know, actually, when we first met each other many, many years ago, when you were in Chicago and at Chicago, uh, and I was here in Boston at Harvard, we were both teaching in the Clemente course, you were teaching philosophy, I was teaching American history, I still teach in the, the Boston course, which you've spoken to a number of times, uh, which is at our graduation last night, actually. Uh, and uh, one of the things that strikes me, because I too have, I opened my American history class with a reading of the declaration. That's how we begin every year for 21 years now in this course. And one of the things that I'm struck by, in addition to the things that you talk about in the book, which really resonated very deeply, powerfully with my own experience as well. But one thing that I find too, is that the students initially sometimes are actually, don't feel connected to the text at all for two reasons. One is this claim of equality, right? This idea about all men are created equal, and life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, which they read as a, a you know, sort of a sham, precisely because they live on the downside of all of these inequities, right? That persist in the 21st century, right? That these folks were talking about in the late 18th century. And so they kind of feel like it's a, it's a, a, a not just a dream deferred, but a, you know, a sort of false promise. 
And the other piece of it, which takes some, some working, which relates to the, the revival of 1776, the musical, is that they, most of these students, are black and brown students, right? These are students of color, immigrant uh, folks in some cases. And so they don't feel connected to it because they feel like this was the product of Jefferson and Adams and Franklin and all of these sort of white guy founding fathers. And so getting them to see the connection that they have to it or claim on it, right, or connection to it is sometimes a little bit hard. So how do you how do you make did you see that and do you make sense of that and how does that square with this kind of resonant and radical project of equality that they deeply relate to for sure? Yeah, no, I mean no question, but that all of those um, concerns and rightful senses of exclusion and distance um, are part of the story and the experience. You know, I, I can't say precisely what it is again. My particular teaching experience. Um, I think, you know, we got kind of lucky in a sense that we managed to sort of have an encounter with a text like the one you get to have in the theater, right, where it's just the thing itself that kind of comes to life first. And then we would kind of come back around to the question of like, who wrote this, what was actually happening, why, and then that, you know, would absolutely bring out the challenge of who the authors were, what their historical position was, what they did in relationship to the institution of enslavement over time and racial domination and the like. And then you get into a kind of big wrestling with sort of what to make of this. You know, I, what I try to spend a lot of time doing is trying to sort of like get people to dig into the question of like, where did they go wrong? So in other words, you know, we can see things that we like, we can see that they went wrong, but what we really want to know is like precisely where did they go wrong? Because like that is precisely the thing that requires alteration. So that is what I ended up spending a lot of time on. Mm, great. I love that. I love that. You know, I, I would just um, add a little yeah, bit sure. to that and just bring it back to the, to, the sh to the show, to the revival for a minute, because one of the ways, one of the things I really love about the way Elizabeth Davis plays Thomas Jefferson is that her portrayal of Jefferson is is wonderfully enigmatic, yeah. right? And so we don't get a sense that like, you know, the words that Jefferson wrote are all about Jefferson the person. Yeah. And again, it's, it allows us to kind of, in some ways detach the idea that all men are created equal as a, se as a, as a self-evident truth, right? That Jefferson was invoking from natural rights philosophy and say, so it doesn't, is, does it matter? whether or not Jefferson believed it and practiced that in his own life, right. right? Or can we detach that sentiment? As I think your students do, Tim, <laughs> I think they do believe that, right? And, that, and their very belief in that, right? Animated in part by Jefferson's espousal and his writing of that into founding documents, right? Allows them, encourages them even to critique Jefferson the person. And I really like the way the revival allows us to do that. Right, yeah. both through Elizabeth Davis' portrayal, but also through the portrayal of all of these of these of this founding generation. Yeah, no, I, that's great. I love that, um, Vince. One of the things that I always appreciate about your work um, and that you always push uh, the, those of us who would who would get too close to an American. American exceptionalist uh, view of things, uh, whether by a, a kind of ideological commitment or just to kind of talking in, in celebratory terms about anything related to the United States as if it's out of context with the rest of what's going on in the world. You push us to see the world, right, and to see the United States in the world. And so I wanted to um, ask you a little bit, and you, you know, drawing on your work, uh, the, the Taki's Revolt, the most recent book, but also the work that you've done on, on the Haitian Revolution, slave revolts in the 18th century, right, you have a, a very broad a kind of global context what we I think we used to call the Atlantic world but you, you, you have a bigger context for understanding these things so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the advantage is or what the value is in thinking about the declaration about 1776 as a predicament about the American Revolution as but one revolution what is the value of placing all of that into a larger global context where we can talk about these ideas about colonialism and, and post-colonial and war and revolution and revolt and, and rights and freedom, all of these big things that we wrestle with. What's the value of seeing the U.S. in the world and of the world? It's a, it's a great question. It's a big question. And maybe I'll just talk about kind of the value to me, why it makes sense to me and why it's familiar to me is because, you know, instead of thinking of the American Revolution just as a kind of founding moment in the creation of a new nation state that we, that we live in, um, you think of it as a proxy war between France and Britain, <laughs> right? And Spain, 
right. and that actually is more familiar to me as an American having grown up in the Cold War and think and, and I'm from Southern California I'm from San Diego which as some of you will know is probably the largest military garrison in the history of the world in fact San Diego advertises itself as having the largest concentration of military personnel anywhere in the world so kind of during the late Cold War period when the United States and the Soviet Union were fighting proxy wars around the world right there was no question but that you had to see all of these local conflicts and part of the, as part of this larger context right those of us who kind of spend time thinking about 18th century empires understand that the big game is being played between Great Britain and France and Spain. And then the Netherlands are in there as well and there are other powers, but for the most part, and the Portuguese are kind of in our rear view mirror in great power politics, but for the most part, that's what's really happening. We're talking about, you know, more than a century of war between Britain and France. And the American Revolution is just a, is a kind of outgrowth of that in a way. So when you see it that way, and of course, there's no way to, to, to think about how, it, how the American Revolution comes to be and the course of the revolution without understanding the great power politics of Britain and France, it adds some perspective, right? And it adds some perspective on many of the questions that we think are unique to the United States, like the question of race and slavery. The United States didn't invent slavery, nor were the, colon the British colonies in North America the most important slave colonies that Great Britain had. Those were in the Caribbean. Likewise with France, right? Many of you will have seen um, the fantastic work that the New York Times did, drawing heavily on the work of historians I know, <laughs> um, on Haiti and how it is that, you know, uh, that Haiti had to pay an indemnity to France for having won their freedom from the French state. And then for the next many decades, they paid a ransom to the French state, right, which bankrupted the Haitians, right? So their revolution, which was only the second revolution for, to create a, an independent post-colonial nation state in the Americas, and one that did abolish slavery, right, yeah, right. was paid for for generations, right? And mm -hmm. that's in part why Haiti is in the state that it is in today. That question of slavery and revolution and what comes of declaring yourself a nation state in that world is a question that can be answered in Haiti as well. We need to be thinking about that when we think about questions of race and slavery and revolution for the United States. Otherwise, I think we're not really understanding the history of the United States very well. Right. Right? So there's, there's that part in terms of these larger questions that kind of come down to us uh, today, the, the, they still matter. But the course of the revolution is, is you know, in part determined by you know, military deployments in the Caribbean, in the Indian Ocean, in North America as well. And you're not really understanding the American Revolution unless you understand that greater world that it emerges from. Mm -hmm. which, which brings me to a question I wanted to ask you, Danielle, about that final grievance that, that becomes a central topic in the second act of the, of the play. I, I, I was laughing early, Vince, earlier when you, you said, I don't, spoiler alert, I, want, I don't want to give away any spoilers. And I think, you know, one advantage to doing a kind of a historical representation is I don't think it's a spoiler to say that, you know, the Declaration of Independence does indeed get signed, right? We do, <laughs> we do know that that happens. It's not an alternative history, but um, but one of the things that the, the second act takes up centrally is something that actually doesn't appear in the final draft of the declaration, which is the, usually the, the version of the declaration that those of us who actually read it, and I agree with you, Danielle, that too few of us do. Um, but what we read is the final draft of the declaration has a series of edits, which Jefferson referred to as mutilations, right? He was not uh, none too pleased with the, some of the edits that people had. And one of those edits, the largest of them, is a chunk that appears as a kind of final grievance in the document where he basically, where, where it starts, he says, he has incited treasonable insurrections of our fellow citizens with allurements of forfeiture and confiscation of property. He has waged cruel war against nature, human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere or to incur miserable death in the transportation thither. This is a, it goes on, right? And, and in some ways the language is the harshest 
right? The most severe of the language that Jefferson uses in the Declaration. I always think of this as him kind of working some things out in, in draft form. Um, and yet this is the grievance that becomes a source of huge consternation and debate uh, in the Second Continental Congress after the draft of the, the, the Declaration is proposed. Um, and it ultimately gets cut out. And it's a, it's, it's a, it's a grievance that among other things, um, tries to pin slavery on and the incitement to slave revolt and slave insurrection on the King of England as one of the many things that he is responsible for. Um, and yet it also gestures at what Vince is talking about, a kind of global institution of slavery that was part of the settler colonial project across the globe um, that is itself a crime against humanity. So how do you read that? What, what's, I mean, I have my own sense of like why that got edited out and the play, the revival of the musical really tries to take this head on. What do you make of this? This grievance, the, the debated inspired, right? And then ultimately it's erasure editing out of the final document. Well, no, it's really an important passage and yeah. um, great you know, to have it be worked in the second act there. And the fact that it was written and then debated and then erased, I feel like that's the whole story, right? That is, this is a country that originated in conflict right from the very beginning. It's really important that there were multiple voices um, right at the beginning um, of the sort of formation of this particular political jurisdiction. And those voices did include anti-enslavement voices already at that point in time. It also included factions. The South and the North had very different points of view. By this point in 1776, both John Adams and Benjamin Franklin were already against enslavement. Um, Thomas Jefferson was like this massively, you know, megalomaniac, conflicted, complicated character who had a set of philosophical principles, but very different sort of sense of social realities. And so, you know, was at some level against enslavement, but did not want to embrace a multiracial country either, right? It's like that's how it sort of gets parsed um, on his account um, in a sense. So, you know, it matters, you know, that all these perspectives are kind of banging around. But I think, you know, just for me personally, it really matters to say out loud that there were real anti enslavement voices already active at this point in time. And in fact, Massachusetts abolishes enslavement even before the Revolutionary War ends. That's so right. that's how true we know that there was actually a real debate about the question already at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, certainly there, and I think Danielle is absolutely right to point out that there were, there were strident anti-slavery activists. I mean, in the 18th century, you can even go back to Benjamin Lay, the abolitionist yeah. Quaker dwarf, right? Who was, he was an abolitionist, he was a vegetarian, <laughs> uh, and, he, and he, was, he was so radical, he was kicked out of the Quaker meeting, in fact, before the Quakers came around and became uh, abolitionists themselves. I think there's also an interesting backstory to, the, to Jefferson's writing of that passage in the first place. Remember, what he's talking about there is the slave trade, right. mm -hmm. almost more than slavery itself. Now, this gets a little bit into the weeds. I'm a social historian, so that's what I do, right? By the third and fourth decade of the 18th century in Virginia, the enslaved population was reproducing by natural means, right? Whereas in places like South Carolina and certainly the Caribbean, it was not. The population was only grown through the slave trade itself, right? Virginians, for the most part, people in the Chesapeake had all the slaves they wanted for their economy. And they didn't want to be beholden to British merchants who commanded the slave trade for the most part. So in fact, Virginians um, passed taxes, high taxes against, or against the slave trade in 1767, 1769, and 1772. They were all disallowed by London because the merchant interest was stronger in London. Now, why did they pass that legislation against the slave trade? A, they didn't need the trade as much in the Chesapeake. B, they understood that the slave trade was a source of war. And they were looking to the Caribbean in the 1760s, where there was revolt after revolt after revolt, led by enslaved Africans who came directly from Africa and staged war against plantation society. The Virginians were scared of that. They were reading news of what happened in the Caribbean, and they were terrified that what happened in the Caribbean in Jamaica might happen in Virginia. And they were also irked by the power that London merchants had over determining the prices of slaves, right? So, you know, this is something that happens in the 18th century. By the early 19th century, 
the Chesapeake of Virginia with its, its population of native born enslaved people, right, becomes one of the greatest sources of the slave trade for the new territories in the South. And so where North America probably imported about 400 to 450,000 enslaved Africans directly from Africa over the entire course of the slave trade up to 1807, in just 40 years to the mid 19th century, they traded a million people down to the new territories in the expanding cotton economy of the South, right? So in that moment, the slave trade could be distinguished from slavery, even where the slave domestic slave trade would absolutely um, be one of the primary sources of Virginian economy in the 19th century. Yeah, that's great. Crucial, crucial context. Uh, I want to, before I ask you each um, a final question here, I want to encourage folks who are on the Zoom call here and listening to the conversation to participate by submitting your question to the Q&A. And I will, after we have one more question and response, I'll be uh, looking for those questions to ask our two distinguished guests here. And I'll, uh, we'll, we'll do that in a couple of minutes. Um, so Danielle and Vince, I wanted to ask you one final question here before the Q&A, uh, which is one of the things that strikes me, you know, and as you both know, I've done a, a fair amount of work on the what I call the radical tradition in the United States, or radical traditions. Uh, and one of the things that strikes me over time in the United States is how just how often different groups, very, very different from the founding fathers, invoke the declaration, right, and invoke the language and even rewrite it in some cases. Um, but the kind of egalitarian promise of the Declaration, that project that, Daniel, you write so beautifully about, um, is something that they really, that resonates with them. Whether you're talking about labor activists, you're talking about abolitionists, and civil rights activists, you talked about women's rights advocates, LGBTQ folks. I mean, so many people over time uh, in their own movements invoke the Declaration, the spirit of the Declaration, in order to, to push forward their, uh, their, their, their causes and claims. I mean, even Lincoln, right, in the Gettysburg Address, when he says four score, Right, he's not referring to the Constitution. He's referring to the Declaration of Independence. Um, and so I'm wondering. Um, and there's a moment in the second act. I think it's in the second act, which gestures at this. There's a spectacular kind of theatrical moment in the in the second act where the the kind of continuation or the through line of the Declaration across time and space becomes visible. Um, what is the relevance or the resonance or the importance of the Declaration now? Right for us in this time where we have so many predicaments, so much violence, so much inequity, right? So much that flies in the face of that egalitarian project. What does the declaration do for us in this moment? Well, boy, Tim, you know, you always ask the big hard questions, that's for sure. So uh, I think I'm gonna give you an answer that's a little small, but I hope it'll open up um, a prospect, I want to come back to what I take to be the mistake, okay, in the declaration, and um, the importance of naming the mistake. And the beautiful thing is that, you know, Abigail Adams named the mistake in the declaration right at the very, very beginning. And it's, it's there loud and clear in the play too, in the first act. I love the moment when Abigail Adams gives voice to the core mistake. And I'm going to be really technical and precise because I think so much hangs on it. Um, so in that, you know, all important second sentence of the declaration that starts, you know, when the, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and so forth. It's a very long sentence. I, you know, I think I'm just going to say the whole thing because you got to hear it. If you'll forgive me, okay, I'll just do the whole thing. You know, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, this is the important part, it's the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principle and organizing its power in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. So like that's the whole long sentence. It's not about my rights, it's about our rights, what we do together collectively to affect safety and happiness, judging when things aren't working and then you know having a revolution, whether alteration or you know abolishment for that revolution. But the really important part there is that the work to be done is to lay the foundation on principle and to organize the powers of government, okay? 
And in 75, 76, when John Adams was working on this stuff, because one just Jefferson, right? And he was working on all these ideas and working on the declaration with Jefferson. He got incoming from Abigail, from others who said, you know, where are the women? Where do they fit in? And, you know, what about working men without property? And what about Negroes in the vocabulary of the time? People literally said that, like, don't, shouldn't they get to participate too? So that voice was there. It existed at that period in time. And Adams's answer was, more or less, you know, the principles apply to everybody, okay? So this notion that we're gonna protect rights and like we're aiming to pursue, that's for everybody. But how we're gonna organize the powers of government, that's gonna be the masculine system, right? That's the phrase that he uses and by which he meant not just male, but white property owning masculine system. And so when Abigail says, you know, but men are tyrants, and if, you know, fine, you know, we'll give you one more try at this, but history shows, you know, men are tyrants. They abuse the power that they were given when they've given it without limits. And if it turns out that that happens again, you know, we'll foment for voice and representation. She was naming the error. If you think you're going to actually protect rights for everybody, you cannot give anybody absolute power over other people, period. And so like she said it right then, and it's taken us like 250 years to actually right. come to grips with this. But that's the key thing. Like power has got to be shared fully if you're gonna have any chance of realizing the principles in the declaration. And I believe that's its legacy for us in this current day. Danielle, that was hardly a small answer. To <laughs> well, it's, it's this that teeny was, little textual like that, point. No, you know? Maybe a specific point. It's not a small point. That was a, that was a word and a half. Good. Danielle dropped the mic, and I'm not going to pick it up. <laughs> I know, right? Right? Uh, Vince, do you have anything you want to add? Or you're just going to pick the mic up. It's there it Danielle is. Remember, the mic. Yes, yes, exactly. Good, good. That was great. I think uh, we have to the moments the the, from the audience. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I love the moments in the musical where John and Abigail are are singing to one another, and and she's holding him to it's account precisely the way that you're talking, Danielle. Wonderful. So we do have a couple of questions. Please keep the questions coming in, but we have two that I'll start with. The first is um, you talked about we talked about at the beginning the past belonging to everyone and no one, right? How would you juxtapose this idea with the way that history is typically taught? in elementary, middle, and high schools, right? We're in the middle of yet another culture war about the, the study of history, banning books, et cetera. So how do, we, how do we take that idea that it's for everyone and no one, right? And then thinking about that within the context of how history is taught, even in universities, but particularly in elementary, middle, and high schools. Well, Tim, would you start with that? Because I mean, I think that be, having taught for a very long time a course on radical politics and having written on that, I'm, I'm wondering how you think that we should be teaching this um, kind of all the way up and down uh, the, the educational system. Yeah, well, see, like, now you throw it back on me. I'm, I'm supposed to ask the question. Uh, that's fine. I mean, you know, I, I always start with this by saying that, you know, one of my books, actually two of my books were almost banned uh, in Arkansas when the state legislature put together a list of books that should be banned. And one of my books is on Howard Zinn. And of course, anything on Zinn was up for, up for banning, uh, but also my radical reader, my documentary history. And, you know, I mean, part of the, the thing that, that, that animates these culture wars, I think, which, which always kind of get in the way of the teaching of history, right, is a fear about what the historical truth, what opening up the past, right, to be more inclusive and more, more contested uh, right from the get go. Right, um, what what that does then to people, right? What once they're armed with that kind of truth, or they they come in to 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 uh, to understand it, or how that then influences how they think of themselves as citizens, right? How they think of themselves as as people in the world. And so my my approach to teaching history, as you know, is always to look at the past as a kind of contested terrain, right? Not just in terms of how you and I and we understand the past in our own time, but the fact that the people in the past, right, the people who we're, we're studying and, and, and learning from, right, they themselves had all these fierce debates, right, there was no con consensus doesn't drive history, conflict does, we know that. Um, and particularly in multiracial democracies, right? And I think that that's, that's something that animates the way I try to teach history is to, to bring in as many voices as possible and to see the kind of collisions and the conflicts and the messiness of that 
as not something that, that requires us to erase whatever we need to erase to tidy it up, but to actually hold the mess and to understand that, that a deeper understanding of the kind of muck and the mire of history is precisely what we need, right? To understand the way that democracy functions and does it, right? So for me, it's always about multivocality. It's always about multicultural representation. It's always about um, the sort of top and the bottom, the inside and the outside, all of these sort of, um, democratic dramas and collisions, I think are really important to teach. And I think that freaks people out. Yeah, right? that's great, that's great. I think the other thing that we need to do is encourage people to think about their ancestry differently. Because when too many people kind of approach history, they think, well, I'm white in the present yeah. or I'm black in the present. Therefore, I can only identify with the white or the black people in the past, right. which is a strange way to think about history, right? So if what we're saying is one of the fantastic things about this show is it's denaturalizing the association between the ideas and the people who may have penned them in the 18th century, mm -hmm. shouldn't we always be doing that with history? I mean, shouldn't I also look to Thomas Jefferson's ideas and see them as my own or see how they can be my own? And likewise, shouldn't any white kid in the United States also be able to see himself in a slave rebel fighting for freedom, right? Maybe even on Thomas Jefferson's plantation? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, we, we are, we are the inheritors of all that history. Yeah. We're not to be able to identify with it without fear or favor. Yeah. I mean, when I think about what David Walker's appeal did to me when I first read that, that shook me to the core. And I teach that in every class I teach, but you want to, you want to hear a radical voice. Go, and I, I, I mean, I, David Walker and I have very little in common, I think, but maybe we do right. have more in common than I think. Right. But I love that point. Right. This, the de almost a kind of decoupling in a way of identity and politics and yet still understand their interrelationship. Danielle, how about you? What would you say to that? Well, I'll just throw into that. I think something goes along with this theme is that then the kind of relevant act is an act of listening, yeah. right? This incredible array of voices in the past, can we hear them all? Mm -hmm. And what do we want to say to them? And you know, what arguments do we want to have with different of these voices? And I, what I say this too, what I'm underscoring is that we, we can listen so much better now than used to be the case when I was a kid. I would, I used to ask my teachers, you know, well, what was life like for enslaved people? And you know, good spirited people, though they were, they would always say, oh, we can't know, it's impossible to know. You know, there's just no way. So just you know, go on with your day, Danielle. We're not, that's not a question we're going to attend to. And so the wonderful thing of my lifetime is that over the course of this last half century, you know, scholars have rectified that problem. You know, we can hear the voices of people who were enslaved. We can hear the voices of people who were free in the 18th century, and all kinds of voices of working people, of women and the like. And so I just feel like, we live in an age where the luxury to hear a range of voices from other points in time like, has never been so kind of, we've never been so richly endowed with that luxury. So I really, the work we do in civic education in K through 12 um, through my center, we really try to support that kind of project of listening mm -hmm. and listening across experience, across expectation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. Every time I when I teach communication, I talk about communi all communication is a relationship, right? And to speak is only one part of the communication project, listening, right? What Thich Nhat Hanh called deep listening and its relationship to loving speech, right? I love that idea. And as historians, right, and the scholars of the past, we, we do this too, hopefully. Um, so we have, we have actually had two questions that I want to kind of put together because they do relate. So one question uh, came in that, um, uh, you know, how do each of us see the arts as playing a role in our modern political discourse? And another question that's not unrelated is um, about our experiences working with the 1776 cast and creative team and how or if that helped us to consider and explore the historical source material and in our own way, right? The, the relation, the power of the arts, not only to, to sort of represent history and to influence politics. And remember this revival was supposed to go to Broadway in the fall of 2020, right? I mean, remember we, I, I, that, that never escapes me when I think about this. Um, and yet here it is now in 2022. So what is the role of the arts in this kind of political terrain, uh, particularly historical, Art and then you know how how has working with the cast and creative team influenced how we read and how we listen and understand? Well, I know we only have five minutes, so I'm going to be very short with my own answer. Um, but for me, it's really in imagination and empathy. 
um, because it's it's what intersects with what I think of as my kind of my my primary tools as a historian, right? Can I imagine worlds that are not my own? And then can I empathize? That doesn't mean always mean sympathize, but empathize with those historical figures um, enough so that I can understand, as I said, their predicament, and then imagine the worlds around them that they're acting in. That's so crucial to me. And that's especially with, with actors and directors, choreographers, the work that I saw happening on that stage was a real work of empathy and imagination um, that provides us access to those ideas, access to some interpretation of that past that we wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Danielle? Yeah, and no, I think that's Vince's mic drop moment as well here. So I don't have too much to add. Um, but just to say exactly that, I mean, I think the, the beauty of arts engagement or artist engagement with history is to give us that, you know, to bring alive that process of interpretation and independent encounter with these distant things from strange lands that, you know, lands that are in the past, that's what gives them their strangeness and so forth. But we all need, you know, encounters and to be, to, to sort of participate in the encounter sort of led by a creative mind is just a, a wonderful, special thing. And, you know, it's a gift to those of us who sort of get to, to travel along. Yeah, I love and that. And people will that. see it in the show. I mean, there is a spoiler now here. So plug your ears if you don't want to hear any spoilers at all. <laughs> but the, the, the Asian American woman, I think her name was Sarah. I forget her Sarah last name. Sorry. Sorry? Sarah Porkalab. Sarah Porkalab, who plays Rutledge, the South Carolina mm-hmm. slaveholder and has to carry the weight of the pro-slavery argument in a massive, like incredibly choreographed piece that comes to me at the climax of act two, right? The kind of empathy and imagination that took for her to inhabit that role in the way she did was astounding. And for me, modeled um, a kind of openness that I need in my own work. I'm so glad you brought that up. I thought that that scene, and it's a long scene, it's an extended scene, it is brilliantly choreographed and staged uh, with Sarah um, singing that signature song is really one of the most spectacular parts of it. Um, Wonderful. Um, Before we go, I just wanted to drop into the chat um, uh, the link to the Harvard and the Legacy of Slavery Project report, which I know Danielle uh, and Vince both had something to do with. This is a report um, that's been long in coming um, and is part of a larger effort of universities in the United States to reckon with their own institutional history and particularly the, 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 their complicity and, and support for, and then the legacies of slavery that, that last. And this is a, a report I will say that um, I, I, was, I, was, I was curious about when I knew it was coming, I was wondering what it was gonna do and um, it does some pretty remarkable things. And so I wanted to both thank both of you for whatever role you played in this and also in the roles that you play here at Harvard um, to reckon with some of the most difficult aspects, not only of our institution uh, and this complicated, messy <laughs> uh, university that we all belong to, and also with the larger questions in the world, um, the moral and ethical questions that are so um, so urgent in our time, and to also to, to bring alive the past in your own ways. Both of you are models of how to do that work, both as institutional citizens and historians and philosophers and also as global citizens. And it's just an honor to be your friend and your colleague and all of that. But I encourage everyone here to read the report and to reckon with it yourself because it it matters and it's important. And uh, the more we reckon, the more deeply we reckon, the more honestly we reckon with history, I think the better off we we are and we will be. So with that, Vince, Danielle, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so Uh, much, Tim, for being such a brilliant partner in that conversation. I very much appreciate you. And you you as well, Danielle. Here, here to both of you as well. Thank you, all three, on behalf of the ART. I just want to thank you, Danielle, Vince, Tim. Thank you, Tim, for bringing together this extraordinary group tonight. Danielle, I think our declaration was the very first book we read when we, we knew we were doing 1776. Vince and Tim, thank you for all the engagement that you've had with the cast over the past couple of years. Thank you all for being with us tonight. And we are at time, so I'm gonna thank our audience as well for joining us. Good night, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Good night, thank you.